Bespoken Spirits is a modern spirits company blending technology and tradition to take craft spirits to entirely new heights. Their unique craft maturation process unlocks amazing flavor combinations while reducing the environmental impact of each sip. The process is all natural and uses only the highest quality ingredients carefully sourced from the best mills, coopers, and distilleries. The result is an unparalleled flavor experience and something you can feel good about drinking. But don't take our word for it. Try it yourself. Bespoken Spirits award-winning products can be purchased through retailers or online. Learn more at www.bespokenspirits.com. Proudly made in the USA and inspired by the American lifestyle, Country Smooth Bourbon was developed by the first female founder and CEO of an American bourbon whiskey company as a refined experience to be savored on its own or enjoyed in cocktails. We are dedicated to celebrating the spirit of America and the crafting of premium bourbon whiskey. To learn more, visit CountrySmooth.com, where you can order online or find a retailer near you. Cheers. Country Smooth. Female founded. Country grounded. With Liquor Barn, you can shop your favorite bourbon, that perfect bottle of wine, or discover something new. To place an order for pickup or delivery, download the Liquor Barn app, visit LiquorBarn.com, or call your nearest Liquor Barn location. Follow us on social media and subscribe to our email list for all the latest news on products, promotions, and events. Liquor Barn, where Kentuckians go to celebrate life. Cheers! There's a new award-winning four-grain straight bourbon whiskey that's been taking the market by storm. Penelope Bourbon. Penelope's balanced yet flavorful taste profile comes from a unique blend of three bourbon mash bills. Currently available in three expressions, four grain, barrel strength, and toasted, Penelope is remarkably smooth and flavorful. So whether you're sipping neat or using it in your favorite cocktail, Penelope is perfect for you. Penelope Bourbon is available throughout Kentucky as well as select markets and online at PenelopeBourbon.com. Welcome to the Bourbon Life Podcast, your source for all things bourbon. Join your hosts, Mark and Matt, as they drink and review bourbons, share news about upcoming events, interview the who's who in the bourbon world, and most importantly, bring you along for the fun of living the bourbon life. Now, here's your hosts, Mark and Matt. All right, everybody, welcome back for another episode of the Bourbon Life Podcast. I'm your host, Mark, and with me as always live in the Bourbon Life Studios tonight is my good friend, my co-host, Matt. Matt, how you doing, man? Hey, Mark, I'm doing really well this evening. How about yourself? I'm doing great, man. It's been kind of a shitty day, <laughs> for lack of a better word, but I'm excited to drink some great whiskey tonight, man. So just always, you know, when I have the podcast scheduled and I'm, I've had a bad day, I'm always like, oh man, you know, it's going to be, you know, an hour and a half, two hours doing a podcast. But then when I start getting into it, it's like, I get so excited about it. You know, just, I love being able to hang out and drink and just have a good time. So it always makes a bad day so much better. So I'm just, I'm happy to be here, Matt, for sure. Yeah. It's a really nice nightcap for us here as yeah. we record in the evening. Yep. Oh. Yep. I, I agree with that. So of course we are the Bourbon Live podcast presented by Bespoken Spirits. Um, we do want to thank all of our sponsors, uh, everything they do for us. We really, really appreciate that. Um, I do, Matt, we do have a Barrel Society birthday and that's uh, Mark Magolis. So I want to put that out there. So happy birthday to Mark. Hey, um, happy birthday, and, Mark. Yeah, man. And with that said, Matt, that's all I got. You want to tell everybody who we have with us tonight? Yeah, let's get to it. So we have a repeat customer here on the Bourbon Life podcast if you tuned in on episode 27, or if you didn't tune into episode 27, now you know it is or was episode 27. And go back had, and listen to it. <laughs> that's right. Or, yeah, go back and listen to it. I think, yeah, we were we were kind of hitting our stride by then. I think I so. I going to say, if it was one of our first five or seven or so, I would say <laughs> you maybe, don't listen to maybe don't go back and listen to those. But this this was a good one. Yeah. So we've got him back again. He agreed to do it. We have the head distiller from the Spirits of French Lick, Alan Bishop. Alan, welcome back to the Bourbon Life Podcast. Yeah, man. Uh, <laughs> I, was, I was literally 
I was queued up to make an Axl Rose joke that I've been over here like dying from fucking laryngitis, laryngitis or something for like three weeks, and I'm drinking and smoking, so I'm in I'm in great form, guys. I'm in great form. So. Oh, this is awesome. Yeah, man, that's that's great. You know, it's funny because I went back and listened to our last episode with you, and uh, like halfway through the show, you you lit up a cigarette. I was like, Alan, there's no smoking on the burn. <laughs> I remember that because that was what I like. There was a there was a little while. <laughs> where whenever I first kind of like at Copper and Kings when I worked there, like I didn't really pay that much attention. Like what is proper etiquette when you do these things, right? Yeah. We got Spirits of French Lick kind of up and going and started getting a little traction. And I was like, I'm going to try to be a mature adult human being. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and so we got your offer to come on the show. And I was like, I'm not going to smoke during the show. Right. Because somebody had said something to me like, oh, you really shouldn't smoke on these podcasts or whatever. And I don't know. I think you guys were like the breaking point where like halfway through it, I was like, you know what? This is like, screw it. It's like the fifteenth one of these I've done, but this one these people seem cool as shit. So I'm lighting a cigarette and fuck yeah. it. People can make their yeah. judgments. Yeah, man. We were we were cool with that. I'm still waiting for somebody to, to light up a blunt, you know, to go all uh, Elon Musk on us here, man, and just, you know, fire one up during the during the show like he did on Joe Rogan. <laughs> you know, I I I Elon Musk uh my whiskey den with a a corn cob pipe and nobody said anything because they just presumed it was my redneck ass smoking tobacco, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, Alan, man, we're happy to have you back on the show, man. We really appreciate you joining us tonight. You've had, since episode 27, um, just a lot of things going on, man. And we'll get into that. We'll unpack all of that over the next hour or so. Um, but before we jump into everything, um, let's talk about what we've got poured up, um, what we're going to be drinking in this first round. Because we've, we've poured up, this is, I think, if I remember correctly, on our previous episode, we had a bottle of this. If it's the same distillate but it was only two years old i believe at that point in time so is this the same thing yes sir uh same thing uh only difference obviously two more years of age on it and then the first round uh because i always try to switch up our apple brandy a little bit every year so the first round were once used um red wine barrels had been recouped okay this is a mixture of uh new american oak number two char uh 24 month air seasons um medium plus toast heads and there's some 64 gallon hogshead barrels in there, which are once used bourbon barrel staves on the side, new American oak on the ends. Oh, okay. Wow, man. That's a lot of combination there. That's, yeah. uh, that's pretty cool. That's a, that's a lot to, those, a lot of variables uh, there. You know, those, those hogshead barrels, I'm, I'll say this before you guys taste this whiskey or before you taste this brandy, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, I would, I would never pilfer product from my own company. But if they were going to make a Netflix documentary about pilfering products, <laughs> I might roll one of those 64 gallon barrels at the back of my truck and just, uh, yeah, I don't know what the hell happened to it. I don't, I don't know. You know, it's funny because we actually had him on our podcast, uh, mm-hmm. Alan earlier this year. <laughs> so right after that, right after that Netflix came out, but if it happens, man, we will gladly have you back on the <laughs> show. And you can, you can tell everybody your side of the story. What really, right. really, really happened. I'm, right? uh, I, I'll tell you, I'm real glad I don't have to look over my, uh, my left shoulder no more. I'll just say that. <laughs> I think my wife more than anyone is happy that we don't have to look over our left shoulder anymore now that I'm in the industry. So, oh yeah. Yeah. I'm sure about that. All right. So, so this is the, um, the old Clifty Hoosier apple brandy. Yes, and sir, this is a, this is a hundred proof. Mm-hmm. Um, now is this, is this, this hasn't come out yet though, right? It has not. So I've okay. had this. I've had this dump for a couple months now. This was. This is my baby beyond all my babies, guys. This is apple brandy. Is really my heritage where I come from. It's really my family, Southern Indiana, the whole thing, and it's my passion. It's also my passion to make people realize that apple brandy is like bourbon's sexier older sister, right? It's. It's really. <laughs> I mean, if you can identify with bourbon, you're going to find something in apple brandy where you're immediately like, yeah, uh, I recognize that, but it's different, right? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, so this this has been dumped uh, and in tanks now for several months. And um, like everything else supply chain wise, we couldn't get bottles. We couldn't get labels. Um, I had this this world domination annihilation plan for this whole year, which involved a bunch of products, including the apple brandy first of September and it just did not happen and i'm still waiting on labels i got bottles i got no labels um everybody comes through a distillery for a tour even if i'm not doing tours anymore like if i see a group come through i'm like hey all 15 of you 
come over here to tank because <laughs> yeah. I want it. I want that feedback. You know, I want that. Um, sure. This, for me, this is uh, just a, a real quick little piece of background here, and, and we can talk all the history you guys want to, all my background, all that stuff. But right, the area of Southern Indiana where I'm from, it was the apple brandy capital of not just the United States but the world for 70 plus years. There were 155 legal apple brandy distilleries in what was called the Black Forest of Southern Indiana between 1855 and 1914, which is Washington, Lawrence, Orange, uh, Crawford, Harrison, Perry counties. We are the only distillery within that six county region right now making a Hoosier style apple brandy. We were the first distillery since 1914 to make one. And we are the first distillery since 1914 to make a bottled and bond version of it. And when I say Hoosier apple brandy, um, you're not thinking of like French Calvados. You're not thinking of apple brandy that you might know from the West Coast, the East Coast. You're thinking of something much more in line uh, with bourbon or rye, right. very big, very bold, very heavy spirit. So this is literally poured my soul into this. This is a old school um, yeast that was actually captured from one of the old apple brandy distilleries in Orange County uh, with the blessings of the family that still own that building. Um, we propagated ourselves. Uh, uh, we got this as close as I possibly could to the old school methods that were used here in the black forest of southern indiana as the only black forest distiller making that style in modern day so this is um i mean out of everything even if it's not maybe it's not as hard to make as an absinthe or something like that but out of everything for me uh from a from the background that i come from and where i am from in the world this is southern indiana. this is it yeah, yeah very nice so now bottling wise because i remember the first bottle we had and i still have some of that um, it was that nice, tall, skinny, sexy bottle. You had the label on it that I believe it was the actual picture, an image of the, the was it Old Clifty? That was the mm -hmm. distillery. Was that what it's called, right? Yep. Yep. The old distillery uh, just north of Campbellsburg, Indiana, and what's now called Cave River Valley, a property owned by um, the DNR that you can go hike okay. currently if hmm. you guys are ever here around locally. So, okay. Yeah. So, those, so your new bottles, I mean, that's going to be the same pattern, the same style, and everything pretty much. Same Arizona bottle. I love that Arizona bottle. Arizona, uh, okay. I like that weighted bottle, that heavy glass on the bottle. It's very wasteful. Right. It's a cool bottle. Um, label is going to have a change up to it, a uh, different color scheme. Uh, it will still have a picture, but it will be an illustration. Uh, okay. okay. Uh, that, it'll be an illustration of that picture you saw on that two-year-old. Um, okay. Obviously, and at 100 proof as opposed to 90 proof, um, four-year-old right. as opposed to two. So. And it, So will this be released actually then as a bottled and bond? It will Is be. It, it will okay. be. This, this will be um, another one of the sisters within the series overall of those bottled and bottled okay. as mainstream product. Right. Okay. That's what I thought. I just wanted to wanted to make sure. So Matt, you've been over there sniffing on it a little while. Why you what are you picking up on this one? It's got a really bright, really crisp, tart nose to it. I think uh, of course, thinking it's apple brandy, I'm definitely drawn to the apple coming out of it. Got really nice Again, I got a crisp apple nose, almost a little bit of, I guess, sour apple with it. I'm picking up some caramel. And it just says a uh, really reminiscent of autumn to me. Uh, like there's almost some sort of an aroma of like autumn leaves in it as well. Kind of that earthy um, fall time harvest leaf smell to it. It's really, really nice. Really yeah, nice. It, here's the funny thing. I've been sniffing on this for a while and then all of a sudden I put my nose back into it. And I almost pick up like a um, kind of like a licorice almost odor aroma to it. I don't know if any, are you, Alan, you're shaking yeah. your head. Is I can that? See that? Yes. That's okay. um, that's very much yeast related. 100%. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Cause I've never picked that up before. And you know, last week, well, I guess we tell everybody that we were going to record this last week. We had technical difficulties, which is like, I'm going to start a podcast and just all about technical difficulties of doing a podcast. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> but yeah, so it's funny because I drank about half this sample bottle last week while we were getting ready to do <laughs> to do the show, um, and I never picked that that note up. And then all of a sudden, I just went back in there and uh, and picked it up. But you know, there is also, like you said, there's Matt, there's that caramel, there's there's some bourbon notes type esque notes that come out with that as well. Um, so yeah, it's really it's a very very unique. But I really like the nose on this, Alan. So for me, I, I think of. Um you know, it, I'm sure you all's, uh, your, your grandma, your grandmother probably did a lot of fried apples, you know, think, um, yep. even if you're not thinking of like her stuff, but like even Cracker Barrel, like 
their fried apples that you go and you get it Sunday morning with your breakfast and that whole thing and a little spiced up, a little culinary, maybe a little baked apple pie going on in there as well. But mm. then there's also that big, almost, um, we get this with our bourbons a lot, uh, eucalyptus or menthol or almost a uh, 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 herbal sort of thing, right? That reminds you that you're right. drinking something. It's not just anytime. I tell people this all the time. If you're ever drinking an aged apple brandy and you get green apple, like Jolly Rancher green apple, Granny Smith green apple, there's fuckery afoot, right? Somebody has done something <laughs> uh, to yeah. make it taste like that, you know? So uh, good apple brandy does not have that. Good apple brandy has those culinary baked apple pie things, those, right. those interesting, uh, again, more in common with bourbon than what you would think of uh, a traditional apple brandy necessarily. Uh, and, and that's the fun of it is, there's there's a, a very deep correlation between uh, the apple brandy that was made here in southern Indiana, the apple brandy that was even made on the East Coast, uh, and, and that tradition kind of coming back now, obviously, with, with brands like Copper and Kings and Hubert Robin, uh, of a bigger, bolder, heavier, um, not necessarily more fresh fruit style to the forefront, but culinary style to the forefront, you know, that uh, yeah. it, gives you, it gives you that... You know, um, well, we won't say Kentucky hug because we ain't in Kentucky, right? But we'll say um, <laughs> Hoosier occupied northern Kentucky, which if you, if you abbreviate it, spells honky. That honky hug. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that makes sense. Well, Alan, let's let's talk a little bit about you. You know, we've had you on the show before, but I love your story, and I, I, I think I think you know now that we're seventy some episodes past that, let's go back and let's share that again, man, because I absolutely love your background. I love your story. Um, so if you don't care, man, just take some time and, and just share with everybody really how you got started in the industry and how it led you to where you are now. Absolutely. So I, I, um, I'm big on not being into pretenses and not believing too much in my own bullshit. If, if nobody's, ever, <laughs> if nobody's ever noticed. So, uh, what you see with me is very much what you get, right? I mean, I'm, um, I'm as fucking Hoosier as they come. Right. I'm, my family's all from Kentucky. I'm first generation Hoosier, but you can tell I'm, I'm Hoosier. It just is what it is, right? For better words, whatever, you, whatever your perception of that word is, it is what right. it is. But I grew up in a family um, of tobacco farmers that moved here from Kentucky. Um, they bought this farm here in southern Indiana in, uh, I believe, 1947. Um, and we raised tobacco and we made moonshine. And that's how we paid our property taxes. That's how we paid for Christmas. Um, you know, somebody had something really go wrong with them, whether it was in our own family, within our community, whatever, you know, whatever we could do to help people out. That's where that money came from. We didn't sure. have a lot of money. We just were doing things to make a little extra money. So I always say that I was born into a family of vice for better or worse. <laughs> it's what it is, it's where, ironically, all Southern Baptist, by the way, which is, which is. <laughs> uh, no, you know, I grew up, I grew up Southern Baptist, Alan. So right. uh, I, bl yeah. I believe they call that five gallon Baptist. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, you're either a, what, a snake handling, holy roller or a five gallon Baptist. One of the two. There you go. So, yep. That's right. <laughs> but uh, you know, it just was what it was. And I remember being around my, my, my father, on on you know obviously on the bishop side and and my grandfather on my mother's side wilson um so my grandfather bishop was involved in a little bit but not nearly as much as the wilson's were now it does run in that side of the family too but not as steeply but um i watched those guys make moonshine between beacon indiana and manchester kentucky uh my whole life i was around it when i was probably three or four years old i remember being around a still and it was just like being around a tractor right i mean right we had tractors and we had stills. To me, in my childhood brain, they were one and the same, and all they really represented to me as a kid was, hey, look, there's another reason we can't go do fun shit on the weekends, you know, because <laughs> we're going to be doing that. That's what we do. That's what we have to do to survive, right? So right. Um, there wasn't anything weird about it. You know, obviously, I was told not to talk about it and all that good stuff. But um, so by the time I was about 15, I had the cool parents out of all my friends, I guess. Uh, you know, everybody everybody had a friend that had the cool parents if they themselves didn't have the cool parents. You know, you could have right. friends over right. there come drink if their parents are okay with it, all that stuff. And so when I was about 15, I got tangentially interested in distillation, not for any artistic merit whatsoever. But, you know, you get tired of paying the town drunk to go buy your drinks for you all the time because it's back <laughs> with peppermint schnapps and hot beer. Right. You're going to try right. something a little different. So 
my father and my grandfather were like, yeah, well, you helped out do this and that and the other. And so they built me a little 10 gallon still. And what they did is they'd gone to an auction and they bought, and I, I actually still have this guys. And one nice. day it'll, it'll be on display for people, but, um, uh, it was built out of an antique stainless steel coffee dispenser from Fort Knox, uh, base down in, in Kentucky. And it was a little 10 gallon stainless steel deal, right? And we took and we knocked the, the, it was a little pressure relief valve in the middle of the top of it. We knocked that out and put a little, I think, quarter inch piping on it and threw a little thump barrel on it that was made out of stock pot. I still have the old stock pot and all that stuff. <laughs> And the rules were literally the following because they refused to fucking teach me anything. There was, there was literally <laughs> like, I couldn't go ask them. Can you tell me how to do this? Cause everything in my life has always been like, you know, here's a tractor, go cultivate the tobacco. <laughs> Figure it out. <laughs> Boom, go harvest that 58 of wheat over there. <laughs> Figure it out. You'll be all right. So it was literally the rules were, um, don't blow your ass up in the backyard and bring <laughs> it something when it's worth drinking. And those were literally, that was literally what I was given. Just don't fucking bother us. Go do what you're going to do. You'll figure it out or you won't figure it out. Right? And I think my suspicion is that this was like good parenting in reverse. Like maybe if we let him see how hard this is, he won't really actually try to do it. You know what I mean? <laughs> Backfire of the century. <laughs> yeah. Really. Yeah, but that's where a lot of these fun ideas came from. I mean, like Felice and Claire with the four grain and having oats in it. Like I now know, being a historian and all that stuff, that oats were a huge part of whiskey for centuries. I didn't know that when I was fifteen. I threw oats into a mash bill because I knew oats were a grain, and I knew I'd never seen them those guys use it. Right. So hey, throw them in, see what it does. And that was the first yeah. thing I actually took and put in front of them was basically what became the Lee and Claire recipe later on. Probably not those exact proportions, but. Yeah. something similar to it and then the brandy side of things that that harkens back even to the earlier childhood stuff so we did a lot of sugar shines we did some grain whiskeys and those sort of things sugar shine for those who aren't familiar is a um basically you're not cooking your grains you're basically taking whatever grains you're using as a raw grain you grind them up more or less right you know around here you're using a cattle grinder which doesn't do a great job that's what right. we did back in the day and then you throw one pound of sugar per one pound of grain per one gallon. And the sugar is really what's making the alcohol, the grain just there to give a little flavor. So we did some of that. But the main thing that we did was brandy. And it's because here in rural southern Indiana, there were trees everywhere. You know, there's apple and pear trees. Everybody at that time when I was kidding, to some extent still today, had either an apple or a pear tree in her yard. Mm -hmm. And all it is is a fucking nuisance to them. They don't want to deal with the yellow jackets and the hornets. So if you mm -hmm. go to their house, you knock on the door, hey, I'll go pick up your shitty fruit out here and uh, make some alcohol out of it. And I'll bring you back a jar. And people say yes in a heartbeat. So <laughs> I grew up making brandy because it was cheap and easy, right? You had access to it. And, and, but I quickly learned to realize too, for me, brandy is my passion. And maybe that's because that's how I grew up. Maybe it's right. I think it has a better flavor to it. Maybe I think it's more diverse than bourbon, whatever. But um, I, I, for all intents and purposes, bourbon writes my checks, but I fancy myself a brandy distiller. So, gotcha. And so after that, you ended up you ended up working with uh, Copper and Kings, right? I did so. I um, I got real interested in distillation as far as theory goes when I was probably twenty four, twenty five, somewhere in there. Uh, I was run. I turned the old tobacco farm into a produce farm. You know, did the whole um, farmers market, sustainable farming thing here in the Ohio Valley, which. No one gave a shit in the Ohio Valley, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You got odd colored tomatoes. What the fuck's wrong with those, right? Or yeah, right. you got tomatoes before everybody else. That's great until the first person in the neighborhood pulls up with a trunk full of them that are free, right? And you ain't making right. no money. So you set on all this stuff and you go, all right, well, I'm not only losing my ass economically, but uh, now I got all this stuff I got to do something with. What do you do with it? Well, distillation is inherently agricultural. It's... Uh, we grew some weird, weird field corn this year, right? Right. Odd color, whatever. Smash it in, right? But still, see what it does. So by the time I was 27, I had a – now, let me tell you right now. I'll just preface this with the following. Uh, I might have been the winner of the century as far as uh, losers go. Uh, you know, just living with my parents until I was 27, 150 gallon pot still in their backyard. You know, my dad just going, I'm telling you right now, if the helicopters land, you're fucking on your own. Right. <laughs> it's like, I know nothing. I yeah. don't know this guy. 
basically. <laughs> yeah, he's been holding me gunpoint for several months now. But I had 150 gallon pot still in my parents' backyard, literally just set up on cinder blocks. It was an old dairy tank. Um, oh man! Oh, dude, it was it was crazy. It, the thing ran forever. We had two we had two what they call cores, so we had two holes that were welded into it with a core that went all the way through to put gas uh, burners through, right? And it's still, uh -huh. this thing would run 13 to 17 hours at a time. It was ridiculous. Wow. Um, uh, all fine and dandy, right? But uh, so at some point in time in my late 20s, I meet my now wife, Kimberly uh, Rats, and um, we're at a party. She's kind of been on me a little bit. You know, you need to, you probably need to grow up a little bit. You need to figure out what you're doing, whatever. And so we go to this party and, and jars that I've made are coming back to me and, and people are walking up to me that I don't know people I've never met before. They know who I am. I don't know who they are. And they're lit. Oh. This is the time that moonshiners became big too. Right. You're right. Right. So they're mm -hmm. asking me to sign jars. Well, that gets a little scary real fucking quick. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And sure. so her reaction to that is, um, you need to go find a job doing this. Or <laughs> yeah. I'm the fuck out of here. And I don't blame her because it was getting a little scary. And so, uh, I looked and looked and looked. And at that time, of course, I don't know if you guys ever realize it or not, but during the time that Moonshiners was becoming popular, that's really when the craft distilling experience started to also explode. Right. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know that anybody's ever made that correlation, but I, I saw it happen, literally. Yeah. So I started looking in Louisville because in Indiana at the time, craft distilling was off the books. It was not going to happen in the state for a long time at that time. And so every distillery that was opening up, I was just throwing in applications, resumes. It was the most bullshit resume anyone's ever seen in their life. Just <laughs> as honest as I could be, produce farm musician, produce farmer, moonshiner. <laughs> moonshiner, yeah. Call me in for an interview. I'm bringing you a jar, right? I, here's a liquid resume. Enjoy, right? Yeah. And I'm not entirely sure that I got hired on at Copper and Kings because I was the most talented uh, or I was the cheapest. And I'm pretty sure it was because <laughs> I was the cheapest person I could get. Uh, but yeah, I got hired on there by Joe and Leslie Heron. And, and, and even though we've had our differences in the past, I, I, to this day, I will thank those two. Um, even if I don't agree with their business tactics and all the stuff that happened after that, I will thank those two for giving me the first foot in the door and introducing me to people who still to this day, help me get the word about out about what I'm trying to do and what I've done in the past, what I'll do in the future, et cetera. Um, Cause they took a chance on me. They didn't have to, you sure. know, they, they literally, there were seven people in that building. When I started you guys, this is no joke. I don't think I've ever told this before. And of the seven, I was the assistant distiller. There was a master distiller there too. I won't say his name. And out of those seven people that were in that building, I was the only one with any distilling experience. And they literally said, enjoy. <laughs> right. Just wow. you're lucky we didn't blow up the entirety of Butcher Town. <laughs> you know, it could have gone bad real quick. I mean, when you go from 150 gallon up to 750 gallon and a thousand gallon still, and here's, yeah. here's a bunch of equipment that you don't understand. Yeah, figure just it out. You know, have fun. Yeah. Here's yeah. here's a tractor. Go out and go out and you know, right. you're, you're used to that, right? It's like right. Yeah. thing. That's a challenge. It's a yeah. Challenge. That, that's awesome, man. All right, so let's jump back and talk about the brandy. Matt, what do you pick up in terms of the uh, the palette on this and the finish? Right away, I get a big old taste of cinnamon. Some nice cinnamon and baking spice coming right up on the front with it. I think we were talking about the culinary uh, profile that you were picking up or we were picking up on the nose. I definitely get it on the palate. Cinnamon, there's baking spices in there. I definitely get the apple and some oak as well. And it's got a sweetness to it. I, I'm thinking like caramel and then a, a nice like crispy dry pie crust flavor, like a little bit of buttery pie crust. Yes. And then somewhere in there, it, it sounds kind of weird, but I'm I'm picking up like a little lemongrass or like some sort of a, like a lemony citrus, but not quite citrus, which is why I say lemongrass because it's kind of earthen as well. But it, it's excellent. And I, no doubt I can sit here and talk about everything, but it's just really good. <laughs> well, I, I, I should also throw out too, before we go too far into this. And I think I did on the last episode too, is that I'm not, um, I'm not too terribly precocious about anything I do. So if there's something that you don't like, right. Right. That helps me as much as anything that you do mm -hmm. like, right. Like if you, if you taste something, you're like, this is shit. 
<laughs> you literally just say, this is shit. And I'll be in my head going, well, what, where did that flavor of feces come from? <laughs> <laughs> where did where did I pick that up from? Maybe it was from the dairy uh, uh, thing that I used as a still that day. No, I'm right. just kidding. Yeah, could have been. Um, been. No, I, mean, I agree, Matt. You know, to me, I picked up that the the apple it's not the green apple like you talked about you know alan that if if you taste that there's a problem but it's almost like a baked apple that almost like a really nice cooking apple yes. you know and you may have put that in my head thinking about my my, my memos fried apples when she used to you know do them on the stove for breakfast and stuff put them over biscuits but you know was, there was always a ton of butter and a ton of sugar and the the apples just cooked down and uh that's kind of what it reminded me of. Matt was talking about the the pie crust and, you know, just in my mind, I'm thinking the whole combination of, of flavors that, that I used to get from that, the apples, the, the, the nice mouthfeel, the buttery kind of flavor as well. Right. So yeah, man, it's, it, I don't have any problems with this at all. I mean, um, yeah, very, very, very nice, man. So, and it's fun cause I, I'm going to go back eventually at some point and pull that two year old and I'm going to do them, do them side by side, even though you've done different finishing in terms of the barrels, which will change that. But I think it'll be fun to, to, to check that out as well. So yeah, definitely right. a good job, man. Thanks, man. Yeah. It, you know, and again, that, that one's a little, a little personal to me and it, it's fun, but the, the truth of the matter is I, I'm, I not only fancy myself a brandy distiller, but also fancy myself a little bit of, um, I guess, uh, the apple brandy, you know, gatekeeper to some extent, like, I want people to, I, I want, here's what I want. Brandy is, apple brandy is such an easy jump for a bourbon drinker. Even you guys tonight, you're not drinking it and going, what the fuck is going on here, right? Right. Everybody has been preaching rum for the past four or five years. Rum's going to be the next big thing, blah, 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 blah. I like rum just like the next guy, good rum. Rum, I do not think is necessarily an easy jump for a bourbon drinker. If I'm wrong, you guys tell me. I think that apple brandy you're never getting a bourbon drinker to switch to apple brandy, but if I can get a bourbon drinker that buys two bottles a month to buy four bottles of apple brandy a year, yeah, it's a win. Yeah, yeah. Right? So, and it's an easy transition, and like you said, um, you know, because as a bourbon drinker, and that's what I enjoy. Um, this the, the apple brandy is just a very nice fit into that. It's a little different, but it still has a lot of that same profile. And a lot of those same characteristics that a, that a bourbon would have. Um, so yeah, it's, it's to me, it's a, and it's a hundred proof bottle and bond, uh, to me, that's kind of a no brainer. So yeah, Absolutely. that's, that's really good. Well guys, we're at the end of round one. Um, Matt, final thoughts on the old cliff D. Absolutely. Apple if, brandy. if this was what all apple brandy tastes like, I would become an apple brandy drinker. <laughs> nice. oh, there you I'll go, man. That. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I definitely really enjoy this, Alan. Like I said, uh, last week when we were trying to do the show, <laughs> before we started, uh, I'd already hit the sample bottle. So uh, I've definitely worked it worked it over. So I'm going to have to send the rest of this home with Matt, save myself a little bit so he, he can at least enjoy some of it at home as well. <laughs> when we roll that bottle and bond out, I make sure you guys get a, get a, get a full proper bottle. With that. <laughs> hey, well, well, yeah, that's awesome, man. All right, well, let's take a quick break, get a word from our sponsor, and we'll be back. Uh, with more of Alan Bishop, the head distiller at Spirit the French Lick in just a minute. Spirit the French Lick crafts their spirits using only the finest agricultural product that has defined character, following their motto, respect the grain. They lead the way in representing the quality of the Hoosier artisan distilling process while paying tribute to its inseparable past. By implementing best practices from those early times, combined with modern touches, Spirit the French Lick has created a truly unique place in the industry. Spirits of French Lick products are distributed throughout Indiana, Kentucky, and Missouri, and can also be purchased online through Sealbox at sealbox.com. Visit spiritsoffrenchlick.com to learn more information and make sure to follow them on Facebook and Instagram. Located just east of Lake Tahoe and the Sierra Nevada Mountains, Frey Ranch Distillery was founded by fifth generation Nevada farmers. Our grain to glass bourbon is made using a four grain mash bill, including a non GMO corn, rye, wheat, and barley, all of which is 100% sustainably grown on the 1,500-acre Frey Ranch. And our commitment to excellence shows with a recent gold medal win at the 2020 Whiskies of the World and USA Spirits competitions. Find out more at www.freyranch.com. All right, everybody, welcome back for round session period, whatever you want to call it, number two of the Bourbon Life Podcast. I'm your host, Mark, and with me as always, 
live in the Bourbon Life Studios, sitting in front of his warm, cozy fireplace, just ensconced with beautiful bourbon bottles around him and stockings hung by the chimney with care. My good friend, Matt. Matt, how you doing out there, man? Oh, good, Mark. I'm just sitting here roasting my tootsies, having a, <laughs> a grand old time on the Bourbon Life podcast this Matt, evening. I, I got I to ask you a question real quick, Matt. I'm sorry. Yeah, what's up, Alan? Where's your stocking? Yeah, I know. The, see, Mark will invite me over for for great drinks and everything. Show me a good time. We record the podcast. But as soon as this is over, I get the door. That's what I get. I don't get a stocking <laughs> hung by the chimney no, with care. No, stockings hung by the chimney with care and packed oh, with minis. Exactly. Man. No, I get a, a warm welcome and a don't let the screen door hit you on the way out. Yeah, that's what I go. get. Enjoy here. your I'll, evening, sir. Yeah. <laughs> Thank, thanks for stopping by. I said good day, sir. <laughs> Those are my mellow mushroom or my mellow mushroom, my mellow moments club. Uh, <laughs> mellow mushrooms a different thing. It's yeah, pizza yeah. And also and also other mellow hookup. mushrooms. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. Matt, why don't you tell everybody who we have with us so I don't lose control here? <laughs> Absolutely. We've got back with us again the head distiller from Spirits of French Lake, Alan Bishop. And Alan, what do we have poured up for round number two? This is the morning glory buckwheat bourbon. Why don't you talk us through that? Oh, so this is a this is a weird mash bill, and guys, I, I apologize. It's on the label. I don't know if she put it on there or not. If Laura Lynn put it on or not, but uh, it I, I couldn't begin to quote you the mash bill. I can tell you that it's two percent buckwheat, which is tiny, but there's also kasha, which is toasted buckwheat. Uh, okay. Kasha is the main secondary grain in that mash bill. It is a very odd, very strange mash bill. This was. Um, I will be honest, this was not my idea. This was the uh, original owner of Spirits of French Lake, John Doty. Uh, he wanted to do this Kasha thing. And uh, so I Kasha, came up. How do you, so how do you spell that? I'm just curious. K-A-S-H-A. Kasha, S-H-A. There's yes. a cereal out there called Kasha, yes. right? Yep, so, just okay. toasted it's a, buckwheat, basically. Yeah, there you uh, go. Yes. Which is a, a pseudo cereal, pseudo grain, et cetera. Um, but he had this idea for this Kasha bourbon and you know, I'm always up for something new, so I wrote up the mash bill and let's see what it does. But um, it is a very strange bourbon. It is one of those bourbons that, um, and I, I think there's probably very few makers out there that would say this about their products, but the first three and a half years, uh, right off the still, I did not like it. <laughs> I'm just going to be completely honest. I did not like it. <laughs> and for the first three and a half years, I did not like it. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, for the first three and a half years, I was not willing to release it. And I did not think at four years that it would be any better. And something three and a half years in one day, literally no joke. It was literally like we did a barrel pick at three years and seven months, whatever. Right. And it had changed so dramatically from what it was into what it is that even I was like, it's not my thing, but people who i don't think will like this like Have liked it nice so, um, yeah it's got a beautiful color to it man i mean it really it's it's a you know i would look at this and think this is something that's been in a barrel for seven or eight years or more i mean it's a super nice you know dark toasty look to it and it's been, it's been in a very strange aging situation, just like Lee Sinclair. So we do have two different uh, maturation warehouses or warehouse styles at Spirits of French Lick. The, uh, uh, the one that's connected to the distillery itself is what we call the chai cellar, which is um, uh, it's not heated or cooled. It works off the act of heating and, or the passive heating and cooling of the building itself. So maybe 30, 40 degree differential throughout the year. Very high humidity, very high angel share, about 7% a year, which would get me fired from pretty much anywhere. Wow. Else. Yeah. Uh, wow. a, lot of, a lot of retention and concentration of flavors. Um, we drive the proof up in there. This is barreled at 105 proof, just like all of our bourbons, number two charred barrels, 53 gallon and larger, um, you know, medium toast heads, et cetera. Um, so all the other parameters being the same, you know, two different uh, yeast. We use our house yeast, which gives a very grain forward flavor uh, for the first half of fermentation, which is 600 gallons. The second half we do the second day which is a brandy yeast, bring out all those fruity sort of flavors. Um, yeah. The big thing on this is that toasted buckwheat, that kasha. That's what's got, that's what comes to the forefront. And I will not tell you what I taste in this until I hear from you guys. And again, you're not going to hurt my feelings. <laughs> I understand completely. Um, 
I have been surprised. The only thing I'll say to that, I've been surprised that this has done as well as it has. When this first came out, I literally had a moment of like all these good things that have happened over the past two years are done. Right. <laughs> but I had to step outside of myself and go, just because you don't like it, you've seen these other people, they like it, right? You got to step outside yourself and say, this is, this is beyond you. This is right. Right. For right. the other people out there. So um, I'm very curious to hear what you guys have to say about it because it is a very strange mash bill. It's a very strange grain to use. Uh, up until a couple of years ago, you could not have called this bourbon because kasha slash buckwheat is not a true grain. It is a pseudo cereal. Um, okay. The one, the other thing I'll preface this with is I can pretty much guarantee you guys that every bourbon you've ever drank in your entire life, if it was made in Kentucky, Indiana, Tennessee, Illinois, Ohio, has had about 2% buckwheat in it because it's such an endemic weed within those oh, okay. states. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. There's okay. no way to completely clean it out. I mean, pretty much if you went to anybody using yellow number two dent corn right now in the industry and you pulled a sample from their bins, you're, you're going to find buckwheat. buckwheat. Huh. It's just Interesting, that. man. So, yeah, I never knew that. Matt, what do you pick up on the nose over there, man? It's got a funky nose, that's for certain. Um, <laughs> I pick up like a little leather or something on it. That's um, funny. I, I was kind of taking some notes here. And the first thing I really picked up is like dusty leather. Yeah. Like a, Which is something I usually pick up like more on a on a really older bourbon or like even some finished bourbons. You know, if they're finished in a in a particular type of uh, a wine cask of some form, you know, I, I, sometimes I'll pick up the leather on that. Um, but these are just finished in oak stay barrels right alan so no no finishing grease yeah okay all that weirdness that you're tasting is literally grain and yeast that's really what it is i mean i like the nose it's not i mean it still comes across as a bourbon there's sweetness to it um and you know like i said i mean to me i detect that leather but to me sometimes that's just a sign of a of what i pick up as a as an older an older you know um not a dustier bourbon but uh, an older and aged bourbon. So yeah, I mean, I, I really like the nose on this, Matt, what else are you getting on it? So, you yeah. know, pick- just to interrupt real quick. This is kind of a fun little note too, Mark, that you might enjoy Matt. Maybe you can, you can comment on this too. And you may think this product shit as well, but so that dusty bourbon thing is actually a note that we get from a lot of our bourbons. Okay. And I'm not sure where it comes from. If I knew what that magic was, I'd repeat it daily, but I don't <laughs> yeah. I have no clue. Couldn't tell you. So, so uh, well, Matt, go ahead. Tell me what you what, what else you pick up on that, man? Because oh, so you I, said you were making notes. Yeah, I get that dusty leather, and then I'm I get a little bit of orange. There's like some orange zest in it, and then I've picked up this strong note of like cinnamon candy, and not the red hots, but like a I, I'm thinking more like a cinnamon toffee or taffy, like a little bit of like a salted cinnamon candy if that makes any sense at all it's got like a kind of like a briny nose yes. to it as well yes. that right. makes sense i will throw a, a tasting note out to you guys real quick and um, all right people either get this or they don't and of course i'm a fat kid so all my tasting notes are a little culinary anyways so. <laughs> <clears throat> And this is something that normally in a bourbon would be considered a defect or a fault. But I think that it's it's not a defect or a fault in this product because it's just the nature of the grain. That particular bourbon on the nose and the palate both for me takes me back to being five years old in the back of my mom's little Chrysler car. Eating those little Reese's Pieces candies that look like M&M's. That uh-huh. peanut butter. Right weirdness mm-hmm. that just hangs around right and for me that's that's what i get from it and that's one of the reasons why i'm not a huge fan of it but there are people that again love it it's just it's weirdness right it's you're talking you're talking about on the palate yeah yep because we hadn't gotten to that point yet but as soon as you said that i was like holy shit <laughs> yeah, i smell can, it too. i can smell that peanut smell- butter note which i couldn't smell it man but as soon as you said that i had just taken a sip of it alan and i was like Oh my God, that is a, that is a Reese, Reese's, Reese's pieces, which I've not had in years since I was a kid. Um, It'll take you yeah, back so, to the first time you ever tasted them. Holy cow, man. Yeah. We'll come back to that on the palate, but that's, uh, yeah, I consider my mind a little blown on, 
on that one. So, you know, speaking, you said you're a fat kid. I was supposed to ask you, by the way, um, when are you going to, when are you going to buy some new pants and stop wearing suspenders? I'm not going to tell you who told me to ask you that question. <laughs> so I'm going to presume that Jolie Clark Casper's said that. It was actually not. It was another person who you maybe do some podcasting with. Oh, was it Christy? <laughs> Mm. Uh, yeah you tell yeah, she Christy me- when she stops drinking fucking gin <laughs> for lunch that's when I'll fucking do away with the suspenders because I'm bringing that shit back listen you guys know this you've seen it you've seen the whole thing everybody in this industry has some character they're fucking playing right sure right and I like to switch mine up every once in a while right you got Fred Minnick he's got the ascot you got Mike Beach he's got the hat and the pipe you've got fucking uh, Tom Fisher he's got the bow tie right the whole thing Mine right. for a long time was these goofy little hats. The only reason I'm wearing mine tonight is because my normal hat wouldn't fucking fit. Uh, the suspenders, I'm making it a thing, guys. I'm bringing your the thing. suspenders back. They're coming back. Uh, it's all, right. all the comfort of overalls with a lot more ease. Well, that's what I say. So being a being a, a moonshiner, you know, you, you wear the the overalls, you know, like the guys yeah. on the on the show. So instead of that, you got your suspenders. Okay, so that makes sense. But yeah, I was I was asked I was asked to ask you. About, about that. (laughs) Wow. I get so much shit for the way I dress for just being a distiller. I mean, nobody walks up to the guy that makes their desk, right? Nobody walks up to the guy that makes their desk for a living. Like, why do you wear those Dickies work pants? (laughs) Right. I mean, come on, man. Give me a break, right? Right. So, Al, let's talk about the distillery itself. Um, So, it's actually, it was, it's a winery um, and it's also a, a distillery. So, can you kind of talk about the, the history of the distillery and the winery itself? Sure. So the, um, the winery started, I believe in 95. Uh, it is a family owned winery. It's owned, owned by the Doty family. Um, John and Kim Doty started this, uh, John had retired from banking. I believe he did a lot of, um, kind of like the farm accounts and stuff like that in Martin County, Du Bois County, Indiana. And, yep. uh, for health reasons, he needed to step away from bank. He had to kind of get away from it. And, um, so he I went think, into alcohol. That's a good choice. Yeah, he did. Right. <laughs> For sure. Yes. Um, and I think wine was something that interested him both from an economic point of view because it was a new thing in Indiana, right? 95, 96. Right, right. Um, but also at that time, you know, there was a lot of talk about French Lick being revived as a casino town. It hadn't been revived yet, but they'd been talking about it. And so you know, he had the foresight to look at that and say, hey, if we're going to start a winery, a sweet wine winery in, in the Midwest, here's a beautiful place to do it at. But in a few years, hopefully we'll have some money coming into it. Uh, you know, when people go in the casinos, they got expendable income. So, you know, if you can capture that audience, it's golden. You know, sure. there's no reason not mm-hmm. to do it. So, uh, so they ran that until... Let's see. They they first started talking about a distillery, I think, in 2014. Around 2013, the Indiana State Legislature finally started talking about legalizing distilling, artisan or farm distilling in the state of Indiana. And for a long time, that was off the books. Indiana was a huge temperance state. Um, right. We're right. still dealing with the ramifications of that to this day. Uh, in a lot of ways, the temperance movement really originated in Southern Indiana. Indiana actually went through two prohibitions. A lot of people don't know this, but uh, from 1850 to 1855, we were under statewide prohibition. And then, of course, we also had national prohibition. Okay. Uh, those were tied to an organization called the Knights of the Golden Circle, what became the KKK, et cetera. They thought that alcohol was destroying the white culture, blah, blah, blah. There's a long story there. We won't go down that road too far, but... For a long time in Indiana, um, the distilling license was completely off the books because there were and still are to this day people in our state legislature who even now consider the bill the still on every hill bill, right? They're afraid that there's going to be a distillery on every street corner. People are going to be making dumb decisions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Regardless of... You know, I I remember going to the summer study committees whenever they first started talking about this in 2013 with my my now deceased friend, State Representative Steve Davison. And, you know, they called it still on every hill bill. And and they said that you had to have your beer license or your winery license for three years. I had to be active. And my response to that was, so why? And they said, well, these people have shown they're responsible with alcohol. My response was, well, I can go get buy an alcohol license from the liquor store owner right now. 
So what you're really saying is it's okay to sell everyone else's alcohol, just don't sell your own. It's really alcohol lobby stuff, right? Right, um, right. So as soon as the opportunity came up, the Dodies were on it. They knew they wanted to start a distillery. John started planning the distillery, uh, started ordering equipment, started laying out the plans for it and all that stuff, came up with the business plan, et cetera. At the time, I was employed at Copper and Kings. Um, and while I do appreciate what I said earlier, Joe and Leslie Heron giving me my first opportunity, I knew from day one at Copper and Kings that that was not the correct environment for where I needed to be at, right? Gotcha. Not only mm -hmm. from, from whatever political reasons, but also because I want to contribute to the history of Southern Indiana, right? Right. And so I was looking for a way out. And luckily, a couple of people had recommended me to John and Kim Doty. I believe Ted Hewer was one of them. Uh, Lisa Wicker was one of the others. And oh, so yeah. I got a call. Uh, Lisa and I have been friends for a long time. She actually, Lisa Wicker and Steve Beam were the first two people that encouraged me to get into this industry legally. And I met them through some of the guys on the Really? Yeah, well, man. We've had Steve on the show. We had Lisa on the show and just absolutely loved it. Lisa yeah. is just I mean, absolutely, she is so wonderful. And we want to get her back on the show. I think we need to do that. But yeah, that's she's great, man. She's, she's, she's what? From, she's a Hoosier as well. She's from Indiana. So. Yep. Yeah. Oh, that's right. I forgot about mm -hmm. that. Yeah, but Absolutely. she lives in Bartstown, right? She does. Yeah. And, and yeah. she works in New York. <laughs> yeah. but, but they're the ones that really encouraged me to get into this legally. But uh, I nice. remember coming back from, um, I think we had harvested our second year's worth of Vidal grapes from Kentucky. And I was kind of running out of um, runway for whatever it was worth, right? Like I'm two years in the Copper and Kings, it's not going to work. Like, And there's a little, there was a little bit of... Um, I guess culture shock that the legal industry could be as crooked as what the illegal industry was and more so. So I yeah. really was looking for a way out and I got a call from John Doty. Hey, can you come interview? So I went up and I interviewed him and I saw the skeleton of the distillery that was built into this old, um, Kimball's piano factory in, in West Baden, Indiana. And, um, you know, even just on the ride over there, just the, the ride itself is an extra 30 minutes past when I was driving the copper and Kings, but, I didn't have to deal with bridge construction. I didn't have to <laughs> right. deal with fucking congestion. You know, I had to deal with an hour and a half wait to get back across the bridge on the way home. Right. You know, so I, pretty immediately I, I knew that I was going to get on up there. And when I when I came to him, I said, all right, because I'm, I'm a little bit of a dick up front, right? I just, uh, here's what I expect to be able to do. What do you guys right. do? Right. And when I laid that out and they didn't say no to any of it, I was like, all right, let's, uh, Let's move this thing forward. And um, for the most part, they they let me do what I do and they moved out of the way. And, and you know, there was a little yeah. butt of heads early on because uh, winemakers don't necessarily understand distillers. And, and in right, fact, right. winemakers probably think distillers and brewers are bioterrorists to some extent. So there's <laughs> there's a little... Listen, we're not um, we're not doing what you guys do, over there, you know. So, but uh, for the most part, yeah, it's it's, it's been a, a very fortuitous thing, and, and allowed me to get back into that six county region, which I'm from, in Washington County, and and play off that history a lot, and um, have people at the distillery. I mean, I was just talking today about collecting all these old stories from these old moonshiners and, and descendants of legal distillers, and being able the past six years to have some of those guys come to the distillery and talk to me about the things they remembered when they were kids and the things. Right. They did. And most of them are gone now. You know, that, that was a cool opportunity, you know, and yeah, I, learned, I, could, I learned more from that shit than I did ever reading books or anything else. So, yeah. So you've, so you've been there now, what, six years? Is that six years this month? Uh, November. Yeah. November 15th. So it was six years. Yeah. Well, happy, happy anniversary. Thank you. That's awesome, man. Appreciate Congratulations it. on that. Well, okay, let's jump back, Matt, and talk about what we're drinking here, man. What do you what do you pick up in terms of we've already talked a little bit about the palate. <laughs> but what what do you pick I up on the palate and finish? That. Yeah, Alan spoiled it, but that's okay, man. <laughs> Matt, what I, do you get, man? That's right. I actually don't get get the uh Reese's pieces, unfortunately. Okay. Right. Uh but I get a lot of coffee. I get right up front, it's there's a ton of coffee, a ton of cocoa as well picking up a lot of cocoa with this and then it's got a on the finish the finish is long let me let me just say i'm i'm really liking the long length of the finish there's a lot of cocoa and then i'm picking up some toasted malt 
coming down with the finish as well. There's like that toasted malt, kind of that toffee flavor coming through on the finish as well. It, this is an interesting one, the whole, the whole way from the nose to the palate. It's been unlike most anything we've had before, I think, yeah, Mark. It's I never had super anything. unique. I enjoy it. Yep. I, I, and, and that's what I want to say, Alan, because you're like, you know, people hate it or people love it. Um, and honestly, I really, I really enjoy this. Um, but the recent pieces that has stuck in my head and that's, that's what I'm getting. But I agree with Matt because the, uh, the finish is very long and I like that. Um, I get some spiciness with it, you know, I get some sweetness with it, but I get that lingering, uh, and you said you don't like that Reese's pieces. And I loved it as a kid. I absolutely, I loved them. You know, you're talking about being a fat kid. Well, you know, you can see me, everybody out there can't, but <laughs> I, I had my share of candy when I was younger. Um, so Reese's pieces or Reese's pieces were, were delicious. Um, but yeah, so that, that brings back a lot of great memories, Alan. <laughs> well, it's interesting too, to hear you guys talk about the, um, the kind of the, maybe the malt component, Matt, particularly, because just like all the other bourbons we do, we do use a brewer's malt for that particular product. And I, I think, and I have to go back and look at notes, but I think that that was maybe a combination, a half and half, uh, depending on the batch of maybe Munich 30 L and then also victory malt. So there are some roasted malts in there. So those things can definitely be contributing to the flavors you're picking up. Yeah, it makes gotcha. a lot of sense to me. This it drinks almost like a like a dark stout or some sort of like a like a porter or a dark English ale with that that malt coming through. Uh, yeah, I'm 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 a beer malt torque guys. The the most boring thing in the entire distillery is distiller's malt. It has one purpose: you convert starch to sugar. And the beer guys get to play around with all kinds of cool flavors that are roasted and toasty and all that stuff. And if you can switch out some of that distiller's malt for some brewer's malt, it's a whole yeah. different distiller, whole different ball game. Very, very cool. So now, Alan, you guys talking about the distillery, your your motto, your slogan is respect the grain. Can you talk a little bit about that? What that means to you, what that means to the distillery? Yeah, that's uh that's a little bit more of me kind of, I guess bullshit thing but fancying myself a little <laughs> bit of a, a brandy distiller right so the idea that um well two first of all if you're going to be on the wrong side of the magic river the magic river, <laughs> you're, on the river, right? you're on the north bank you're the, on the north side yeah that's yes. the that's the the evil side the yes. dark forest i mean they call it right, right the black forest i mean you're as, you're there as though every whiskey distiller in the history of the united states got through the ohio river and they were like i don't know what's over there but fuck that i'm not going <laughs> right <laughs> Right. So if you're going to be on, on the wrong side of the river, but you're also right next to the river, so you're in the backyard of bourbon, right? You got to do things that are a little bit different. So the idea and the methodology has always been that respect the grain idea. The idea that grain has terroir in the same way that grapes have terroir, depending on where it's grown, the minerals in the soil, the variety of grain it is. Obviously, everybody knows there's a difference between the way rye tastes wheat tastes, buckwheat tastes, whatever, right? Those are all different. Right. But there's also differences between a yellow corn, an heirloom corn, different colors of corn, right, et cetera, uh, and where each of those corns are grown at, right? And so our methodology has always been a little bit opposite of Kentucky. So modern Kentucky bourbon is this little tiny spectrum, right? And it's a spectrum that came from a great big spectrum. So if you go from farmer distillers making bourbon in the 1820s, 1830s, 1840s, 1850s, you get up to 1870, now you have industrialization, Low rectification column stills. Good example. Oats were the number two crop in Indiana and Kentucky, both uh, throughout the 1800s. When you get in 1870, they introduced the low rec column still. Oats are a little sticky. Can't really run them through a low rec column still. Oats are out of the mash bill, right? So your spectrum has gone here. Yeah. You get to 1914, 1915, 16, 17. Now you're hitting prohibition. You come out of prohibition. There's six, seven big companies. That spectrum went. Here's three mash bills. Enjoy. Also, we're all using the same yeast brought to us by Everett Bean, right? Right. Um, nothing wrong with anything we're doing. It's just all very similar. And so the methodology became very much so 60 to 70 percent of the flavor of Kentucky bourbon comes from the barrel. Now, the spectrum of bourbon before 1850 was massive. Like we just said, you know, there was all kinds of different grains used, all different kinds of methods used. Um, and the idea is that. Maybe for us at Spirits of French Lick, 
it's not so much 60 or 70 percent of the flavor coming from the barrel it's 50 50 so 50 percent raw material where it's from along with fermentation the yeast that you use the fermentation temperatures all that fun stuff and distillation pot still distillation etc retention of concentration retention and concentration of flavor and aroma and then 50 percent maturation and maybe even the maturation is done differently with a different char a different toast different um temperatures of warehouse etc to where you have a very much a blend and a balance of raw material fermentation right. distillation and then maturation and then this concept of pot still distillation on top of it which is you don't create consistency with pot still distillation you manage it over time mm-hmm. by blending your components um, and for me that's fun if i had to work at one of the big guys i mean no no offense to them and i love all of them and i've had some very good job offers that if my wife saw the numbers, she would probably fucking kill me. <laughs> but I would be the most bored fucking person on the face of this planet if I had to right. run. If I was an operator as opposed to a distiller, right? Right. Yeah. I, just, I couldn't do it. I like playing in the minor leagues. So. Yeah, but I mean, the minor leagues are becoming, you know, right up there with the big boys. I mean, oh, hey, you're, you leagues. are hitting in the majors. I got to say. Yeah, right. no doubt about that. Hey, I was going to ask you about the name on this one too, the Morning Glory, because um, you guys always have very unique names. Last time we were on, we talked, you know, we the old Clifty. We talked about it being the old the old distillery, uh, the Matty Gladden. We shared that story last yeah. time you were on, um, and you name all your stuff: Lee Sinclair, uh, Solomon Scott. We're going to talk about later, and this one's the Morning Glory. So, what's the what's the idea behind that name? Mm-hmm. So this is actually tied back to old Clifty in some ways. So there are account. Well, let me let me just start by saying that. The Boone Trail and the Vincennes Trail both travel through Washington and Orange County. And so both of those were littered early on uh, by 1806, 1807 uh, with multiple taverns. And when I say tavern or inn, it's not the same meaning as what we think of it now. A tavern or inn at that time was very much, um, you know, we've been on the road for 35 miles walking or maybe with oxen, whatever. Uh, it'd be nice to have something to eat maybe something to drink, and maybe a little companionship, right? And so the Morning Glory is a tribute to those early taverns. Um, okay. Which there were many of, and most of the tavern owners also own distilleries here in southern Indiana. The Morning Glory in particular is tied to a tavern with a little bit of legendary status around it. So this this came a little later than that Boone Trail and uh, Vincent's Trail, but um, supposedly... By the 1860s in Camelsburg, Indiana, which is just south of Cave River Valley, again, where Old Clifty was. In Cave River, there were nine commercial distilleries. There was supposedly a tavern, quote unquote, in Camelsburg, Indiana, called the Morning Glory, which operated up and through Prohibition. I could never find any evidence that this tavern ever existed. Okay. What I could find that did exist was a government warehouse for the nine distilleries that existed in Cave River Valley, within which there may have been a crooked storekeeper who ran the warehouse as a liquor depot or a tavern of the time and served up the liquor from leaky barrels (laughs) to patrons and called it the Morning Glory. Nice. I did come across an article, uh, I believe in 1928, from the Salem Democrat, where the Morning Glory had moved its operations to the old Clifty Mill and was operating on the third floor of the mill as an illicit uh, speakeasy and apparently operated by the same gentleman that was also stealing from the warehouse. Um, (laughs) The cover (laughs) art is actually a little tribute to Spring Mill, Daisy Spring Distillery. That's actually a illustration of the Spring Mill Tavern that you see on the front cover uh, of that particular whiskey. So, okay, very cool. Well, that's that's great. I, I always I love the stories behind your your names and your bottles. So, yeah. can I you imagine like walking into a warehouse and just being like, "Yeah, pour me a double." <laughs> yeah, it's like, <laughs> hey, can you go over to that barrel? It's, it's like Matt in a warehouse. You give him a drill. And you never know what the hell. I was just gonna... looking for leaky barrels. <laughs> it's like, oh, <laughs> right. it's like, hey, look, this barrel leaks now too. <laughs> I was repairing them, and it would have been yeah. a shame had yeah. that hit the floor. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 
Definitely. All right. So guys, we're at the end of round two here. So Matt, final thoughts on the morning glory. What do you think? It's super unique. Unlike anything we've had before. I, I enjoy it. It's fun to hear the story behind it and uh, to hear that at three years, five months and 30 something days, this was a, this was a no-go and then it just turned the corner. It's a fun story to hear. I enjoy it. Yeah, I do too. You know, this is, it's a winner for me, uh, Alan, you know, if it, if it didn't taste good, if I didn't enjoy it, I'd, I'd, I would tell you, you know, yeah, it's probably, it's not my jam. Um, but this is one, uh, that I could, I could definitely enjoy easily enjoy on a regular basis, man. So there well, you go. I'm going to, I'll throw this out there to you for the holiday season too. It does make an excellent eggnog because those toasty uh, sort of chocolatey notes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. For that. It's fantastic. That's good to know. Yeah. Good to know. Of course, you know, I usually let my eggnog age. I've got one in the fridge now that's over two years old. I don't know if I'm going to drink it or not. I'm a little concerned. I'm not sure if it's going to last, but um, yes, usually right. I'll go for it. Hold right off the top. It'll be all right. <laughs> It'll be all right. <laughs> all right, guys, let's get a break. Uh, get a word from our sponsor, and we'll be back with more with Alan Bishop, the head distiller at Spirits of French Lick, in just a minute. So everybody sit tight, and we'll be right back. The Stave Restaurant is a bourbon lover's paradise right here in the heart of bourbon country. Located at 5711 McCracken Pike in Millville, Kentucky, between Castle and Key and Woodford Reserve, Chef Kyle Klatka prepares amazing food each day that features an elevated Kentucky-inspired cuisine. With a full-service bar, great bourbon flights, and signature cocktails, the Stave is the perfect place to catch up with friends after a fun-filled day of touring the local distilleries. Be sure to check them out online at thestavekentucky.com or at Instagram and Facebook at The Stave Kentucky. Three Chords line of whiskeys embody the spirit of creativity. The whiskey is a true collaboration between producer and composer Neil Giraldo and master blender distiller Ari Sussman. The Three Chord team of expert blenders, coopers, and sensory professionals have developed a multi-step process they call perfectly tuned taste. This process begins by carefully selecting the finest bourbon and rye whiskeys from Kentucky, Tennessee, and Indiana, and then blending them together. Find out more about the whiskeys and distribution in your area at www.threecordbourbon.com. All right, everybody, welcome back for the third and final round period session, whatever you want to call it, of the Bourbon Life Podcast. I'm your host, Mark, and with me, as always, is my good friend, Matt. Matt, you hanging in over there, man? Yeah, Mark, I made it this far. I am excited for the conclusion here, the <laughs> exciting conclusion, the cliffhanger of an ending that we've yeah, got man. planned because actually... We don't even know where this one's going to end up. So it really we is a, a cliffhanger. What, it is. What I heard was Matt saying, is this shit done yet? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no way. He, he's, man, I got to get up and go to work in the morning. Can we right. wrap this up? Right. Can we wrap this up? Talk this out, Mark. God. <laughs> now I'm on the seat of, I am on the edge of my seat here because we've got with us our great guest, Alan Bishop, the head distiller from Spirits of French Lake. Oh, that's right. Sorry, Matt. I know you hate it when I do that, man. So. I do. It's it's a cheap trick, but it's yeah, it's the best you've got. Can I? I just want to throw out the next time I'm on the show, another <laughs> three episodes down the road. Yeah. Can you throw in there the uh, the Kurt Angle Olympic theme? Because I'll go What's with that. that? You, Kurt Angle. Uh, yeah, yeah. Kurt Angle from WWE. You know, the wrestler. Yeah. The wrestler. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. I'll I'll, I'll track that down, man. I can add yeah. it to my. Good on mixer here, man, for sure. Matt gives me a hard time. He's like, you know, those those sound effects are just awful. You need to, you know, do something. They, they came preloaded. I can't help it, man. So, all right. So let's talk about what we're drinking this round because we got something else that has not been released yet. So I'm really excited to, to get on to this one. Um, but this is the Solomon Scott Rye Whiskey. So, Alan, you want to tell us about this one? Absolutely, yeah. And I, w- I would love to know what barrel she sent you guys because so far... We haven't even done a barrel dump of this, but um, uh, let's see. Barrel number one thirty two is what this says. It's one hundred and five proof barrel. One thirty. Mine's one thirty two. Matt, what's yours? Is nice. it the same barrel? One thirty two. One thirty two. So you got a you got one that's been aged primarily in our um, dunnage uh, type situation where we get high temperatures in summer, low temperatures in winter, and then okay. it's moved maybe six months ago down to the chai, which we talked about earlier, but. Uh, Right. So we went the opposite direction of pretty much every other craft distillery out there. Every craft distillery has this thing where they say rye can age a little less than what bourbon can, and it makes a better product early on. 
And I think if you're talking about column distilled stuff, low rectification column still stuff from Kentucky, you're probably not wrong. When you're talking about pot still stuff, in my opinion, rye whiskey needs more time. Uh, it needs a little more caress. You need to okay. also be very stern with rye whiskey and try to blow off some of the volatility that you don't necessarily want. So we released early on, you know, a weeded bourbon. We also released a weeded and oated bourbon, but we've not done really much with rye other than some finished whiskeys and a high rye bourbon. So this is going to be a five-year-old rye whiskey that is done in a very traditional uh, Ohio Valley style. So this is actually based on the old George Washington mash bill. So like 60 percent yep 60 rye yeah okay. 35 corn five malt um gotcha okay. i was lucky enough to get to go out to mount vernon a few years ago and and be a part of that whole thing with my buddy steve bayshore and sean stevens from vendome and learn a lot from that situation nice. um, but that was also a very popular mash bill within the entirety of the uh Monongahela and the ohio valley if you're in southern ohio southern indiana northern kentucky if you go back into history you will find that mash bill in all three of those states. Interestingly, almost always aged in a hickory barrel, which we did not do here, but one day huh. I hope to do. Yeah, um, wow. I don't know why. I, I imagine it tastes like hickory smoked barbecue sauce, right? With that little <laughs> bit of spice to it and all that stuff. But so for I me, it was long. Right. Yeah. yeah. For, for me, it was important to do a mash bill uh, that was not 95 rye like MGP, right? Right. And also right. not barely legal Kentucky rye. This right. fall, yeah, the right 51 percenter. Yeah. Yeah. So this is right in the middle. It's different. Right. And so what we did to change it up, obviously, you know, barrel selection, you know, as far as number two char again, medium toast heads, uh, as well as using two different yeast strains like we do on our bourbons. Um, and then switching out the malt component for, I believe this is victory malt, which is a little more biscuity. It's a little like dry flaked, uh, like grandma's biscuits, really. Okay. Um, and the idea was to put the emphasis on, does rye have to be spicy? No, it doesn't. People think rye is spicy. It's really the yeast and the fermentation that makes rye spicy. Uh, you you could have some spice in there, but the thing I think you guys will both notice is there's no dill in there. Um, you know, and there's also a, a, if it's there, it's a very small component. Uh, that black cherry note that tends to come through on 95 plus rye, which I am not a fan of. I tried to avoid both of those, but the, it's a very bright whiskey. It's it's much more bright than any of the bourbons that we make. Yeah, it definitely is. Matt, what are you picking up? We're writing notes over there, man. I just, I'm going to defer to you. <laughs> Alan, you know, Matt, Matt is the expert on the show in terms of tasting. No, he is not. He's just, <laughs> he's just the one that says it confidently enough that people think he's the expert. There you go. <laughs> so uh, that's interesting that you said the you switched up the yeast to give a little bit more of like a biscuity baked yeah, the malt, aspect yeah. yeah or the malt excuse me because the first thing i pick up is like graham cracker on it like a honey graham cracker it's got a, a sweetness that comes through with it as well um there definitely there is not any dill there's no no like strong really herbal pull toward toward it as well but i'm getting i think a lot of the corn is really shining through like i'm getting a nice like sweet cream corn coming out as well it's, it's really delightful that's that's also and this is something i don't talk about on a lot of shows and i probably should um you know the, the real art of distillation in a lot of ways is is on the fermentation so we don't sour mash and we don't sweet mash which is entirely different from everybody else so uh, we'll do one of two things. We either use citric acid to lower our pH or we use a malolactic bacteria, actually a, a cheese oh. culture, the same thing you'd make cheese or yogurt out of. Uh, and so this uses a cheese culture. And I'm, I'm very big on both of those because they tend to give a very rounded mouthfeel, um, a very full bodied mouthfeel, a very chewy, quote unquote, style whiskey, which I'm, I'm big on. I don't like whiskeys that finish quickly. I don't like whiskeys that that don't have some element of, damn, that grain is just right, you know, right there on the right. top, you know. So um, I think people pick on the pick up on those things a lot of times, and, and they're, they're elements that aren't ordinarily, um, you know, visible in a lot of whiskeys out there. So that makes sense. So, Alan, we've talked about you, we've talked about the distillery, but, you know, one thing I, we, we didn't touch on, uh, 
before in the first round was that, I mean, you actually do your own podcast too, right? I mean, that's kind of an interesting thing that people don't know. So can you talk a little bit about that, what you do? Yeah, I don't, I don't so much do my own podcast as I, uh, <laughs> I book people and then Christy actually sets everything up and records it and I just show up. So, uh, but <laughs> sounds, yes, like, I, sounds like my contribution to the bourbon life podcast, actually. <laughs> so right. it's a pretty good life. I got to say it, it really is. It really, there's not a lot of expectations other than, you know, if you don't show up, then something's obviously terribly wrong. You know, like you can't find an email or a link or some shit like that. <laughs> So yeah, I've been doing a uh, distiller's talk with Christy Atkinson, which is um, the geekiest of the geeky podcast out there. It's <laughs> not for all the bourbon fans, right? It's um, it's a solid, <laughs> I don't know if this is a brag or not. It's a solid 1500 downloads, right? And it's the 1500 dorkiest fucking distillers and home distillers and moonshiners out there downloading this show. Yeah. Um, and, and that was, that's what we set out to do. You know, I like talking to other distillers. I like to share things back and forth. I like to hear their stories. And that's what we try to do on distillers talk more than anything else is, is tell me what you do and why is what you do unique? Why is it interesting? Um, do you have things you can teach me? Because certainly I've learned things from that show that I've walked away from it and been like, I don't know how you got in this business, Alan Bishop, uh, and didn't know what that person knows. You know, uh, there's been a few of them where I just have to shake my head. Like they're just so far beyond me. I'm just, yep, yeah, yep, yep. You're right. You're right. I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about right now, but you're right. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's what we do. We just very dorky. It's very technical. It's very let's get into the nitty gritty of what you do, why you do it that way, how you do it that way. Break it down. You know, from start to finish. Where's your grain come from? What's your fermentation protocol? What's your distillation? What's your maturation? What's your philosophy? Is there spirituality behind what you do? And then here's a few dick jokes just for good measure. (laughs) And it works, you know, it works, right? So, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, speaking of Christy, she had asked me, she told me I was supposed to ask you as well about uh, about your Facebook page and about a, a Welshman. Uh, who lives in Ireland, apparently, that loves to, to give you some shit. Because, I mean, you know, you talked about it. You, you, you're you with you're with Spirits of French Lick. You guys have had success. We can talk about that in a minute, uh, about how things have kind of really exploded for you guys, I think, in terms of, you know, name recognition and, and what's going on. But, um, you know, anytime you have success, you're going to have detractors. You're going to have the the trolls that are out there. But apparently you have you have one that really just just really loves you. <laughs> Man, I got more than one, and this one hasn't bothered me for a while, but it's funny that Christy asked you about them. Um, I have this personality that tends to draw people out of the woodwork. And for some reason, like people either like me or they hate me. There's no, again, it's like the buckwheat bourbon. There's no buckwheat bourbon. Yeah, you're the buckwheat bourbon of distillers. Okay. You are the morning glory. (laughs) Guys, I'm I'm, I'm, I'm telling you right now, like, I, my dream life is. Facebook and Instagram don't exist, right? And and right, nobody right. cares that I make their whiskey. That's what I would love to do. But I think because I'm open about my background, where I come from, there's a little crossover between that moonshining illicit thing and the legal thing that's happening. It In some ways, and maybe it's everybody in the world who knows at this point with social media being what it is, because it's not a great form of communication, let's be honest. Right, right. But it makes you a little bit of a target, especially if you have an opinion on anything. And so let's just say that there's a gentleman from the British Isles who (laughs) just, listen, guys, you can have your own opinion about whatever you want to do and your own own theory about whatever you want to do. But if you say some shit about distillation historically in a historical context that I know is wrong, I'm going to fucking say something about it because this is what I do. This is who I am. Yeah. All the time. You know, I live the life. This is what I do. And uh, if I say something about it and then you lose your shit, I will tag my friends and we're it's like chumming the water for sharks. <laughs> like, just very much so like I'm going to tag people that don't even agree with me because they're going to have a different opinion than I do and a different opinion than you do. And we're right. going to spend the next three hours talking about this shit. Oh, you get tired of me. Right. And you either threaten to kill me. Show oh, man. my house or delete me, one of the three. And um, this Welsh gentleman who, who honestly, guys, I'll tell you right now, he's incredibly smart, and he wasn't wrong in what he was saying. 
he was half wrong in what he was saying. Right. <laughs> it was the way that he was saying it and the way that he went about it. And I didn't have to tag anybody. I didn't have to say anything to anybody. He literally came at me on a social media page and people saw it and they started tagging each other. And then it turned into this fucking, just a, go- just fucking, just a Halloween movie. That's what it turned into. Just Michael oh, Myers man. stabbing motherfuckers. That's literally what happened. <laughs> No, and and sometimes that's called for, and other times I'm like, "Wow, this is way out of my uh, my control." But I'm going to watch it. Yeah, yeah, Yeah. I'm going to get some popcorn. I'm going to hang out. But you know, but speaking of social media, I mean, it's really social media has been really kind, I think, to you guys, right? I mean, Spears of French Lick, it's helped you guys. It seems like over the last year and a half during COVID, um, to really help you guys spread the word about what you guys are doing. So. Because, I mean, can you talk about that a little bit, how that's how that's worked since the COVID shutdowns? Yeah, absolutely. It's it's a little bit of a two-edged blade. I mean, there's the personal stuff and, you know, people get... Mm-hmm. Right, right, sure. Yeah. And again, I always make the joke, my dad was a, um, he was a custom furniture builder at Kimball's. He literally made stuff for the Pentagon and Library of Congress and President, et cetera. And nobody ever asked him about his job. So there's a little, like, there's a little rub in there where, like, why does anybody give a fuck who makes their whiskey? Right. (laughs) The other side of that is if you're not on social media and you weren't on social media before COVID, you're probably going bankrupt right now. Right. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah. Because we were, we were lucky enough myself. And at the time, uh, Jolie Clark Casper, Zach, our our marketing manager at the time, we were lucky enough to position. Or as we like to call her Kasparzik. (laughs) Kasparzik. Yes. The red, red. Yes. We were lucky enough to have ourselves positioned within social media when COVID hit, right? We were already doing podcasts. We're already doing right. know, lives, tastings. Here's a video on social media, etc. cetera. Um, so when COVID hit and everybody else shut down and it took them a few months, you know, it took, it took the big guys and a lot of the small guys three or four months to really go, well, how do we handle this? Mm-hmm. We were already in place. You know, my schedule went from being, you know, like five appearances in person a month to being like 15 appearances on the Internet a month. Yeah. Right. And I didn't say no to anything. Right. I still don't say no to anything, whether it's better or worse. Right. That, that's why you're with us tonight. <laughs> right? you, just, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. you really got to do better. It's that it's saying no I, thing. Yeah. All right. You could have freed up a, your night tonight. You got to have a you got to have a team in place to vet these people. <laughs> yeah. You're going to have to do better. Yeah. Somebody's going to have to step up. We for slipped you, through the cracks. So thanks but for it, taking it, this one. Now y'all are great, but that, that was the fun of it is, is that watching these big guys, like, we don't know what to do, right? We're doing curbside service. All right. We did that day one. Right. And, and nice. we did tastings yeah. with barrel groups day one and mm-hmm. it wasn't anything new to us. We were, we were not on purpose ahead of the curve. We were ahead of the curve because that's how you survive as a small distillery. Right. If you, if you're, right. if you're looking at a, a soccer team, you've got, you know, big, slow guys and you've got little fast guys. Right. You ain't got right. nobody in between. Right. There's nobody in between. Right. So, you know, if you're going to be small, you better be fast. You better be able to turn on a dime. And that's what we were able to do with social media during COVID. Uh, honestly, I will tell you guys, I don't think and I don't want to make light of this whole thing and everything that's happened. Uh, political distinctions aside. But if it weren't for COVID, Spirits of French Lick wouldn't be where it is. I don't I'm not sure that. Iron Root Republic would be where it is. I don't think Leopold Brothers would be where it is. We were fast. Right. We were fucking, it, that was our opportunity, right? For sure. better or worse, that's the economic opportunity. That's a gap in the market. Take advantage of it right now. Get in. Do your thing. Be, for better, you can even make bad whiskey, right? Be the biggest and the loudest out there on Facebook and Instagram and now TikTok, all that stuff. Get the right. attention. Make them pay attention to you. Don't give them a choice. If you're not on a podcast, be in the comments on that fucking podcast, right? Right, right. And start a conversation because yeah. that's the only way you get people's attention. Nobody cares otherwise, right? Yeah. They just don't. They just don't. Yeah. And speaking of attention, I mean, you guys got some attention this year. Um, and you got some pretty big attention, especially with your lease and clear, that four grain bourbon, um, a pretty popular, well known bourbon critic. Um, picked you guys as one of his favorites, right? Can you talk about that a little bit? I, first of all, I have to say this because, and I know if he listens to this, he'll laugh at it because he knows the, the relationship that we've had in the past. I, I doubt that he listens to our podcast. Uh, yeah, you, I wouldn't, you, I wouldn't you, worry about that. 
you may be surprised by what he does and doesn't listen. All right. I don't right. know one way or the other, but um, all right. He laughs every time he hears that. I guarantee you, because he knows the relationship that he and I had coming up in Copper and Kings. He and I did not like one another. We we did not. That's yeah, the, sure. we hated each other for a long time, a long time. And uh, but yes, he for whatever reason he seems to like our whiskey. I've never. People tend to think it's one of those pay for play things. It's not. Right. Right. Here's, the truth of the matter is every time that he likes something, and I'm not even going to say his name because people can figure it out. Sure. Every time he likes something that we do, I am as honestly and genuinely surprised as you guys are. What I will tell you is he enjoys fucking with me to some extent <laughs> because he might tell me a couple weeks ahead of time that something is in a tasting or whatever, right? You know, such and such is here potentially. Now he didn't do it this last time with William Dalton, which was even more fun in some ways, but he did it with Lee Sinclair. Hey, I tasted your whatever. Right. But he didn't say it was part of this runoff and all this. Right. Stuff. Right. But he won't tell me even if he pre-records everything, how it did just, <laughs> oh, you're, you're going to have to watch. You're going to have to see how this turns out. And I'm like, you fucking, dick right? <laughs> so right so that was like that was his his non-kentucky bourbon of the year right is that it was what? it was yeah and, and i will tell be... you the night that that happened i was standing outside smoking a cigarette on my deck and uh drinking and watching this thing and he's blind and all this stuff and i know we're in the race and i'm watching it and every time he says something shitty about somebody i'm like that's my whiskey this <laughs> motherfucker he has no idea what the fuck he's talking about? You know what I mean? I'm, I'm crossing the magic river tomorrow and I'm going to track him down. That's right. That's right. <laughs> but you know, and, and that's, that, that's been the fun of it for me too, is, is it's almost more fun when you know that there's somebody that is a name in the industry that maybe you think the cards are stacked against you. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And right. the truth of the matter is, with him in particular, the cards were never stacked against me, even if there was any kind of personal weirdness in the past, right? And we sure. got past that, obviously, because he is very honest about what he does, truthfully. And people people don't understand that, but he is. But it's almost more fun when you think those cards are stacked against you and you can get somebody right, to right. something blind and go, fuck, yeah. fuck, just yeah. <laughs> he halfway knows what the fuck he's doing. God damn it. You know, <laughs> and especially when you're on this side of the river, like we, it would, it would be, it would almost be less fulfilling guys. If I was in like Minnesota, right? Sure. Yeah. If I right. were in Minnesota, I'd be right. like, oh, you're, you're the just, outlier. <laughs> right. But right. You're, just, you're, you're right across the river. You can see the lights when you're there, you're working. You're like, yeah. Absolutely. Like, Absolutely. Yeah. And it's but been the really same good. for all those names that are out there, you know, it, and every time it happens, I literally, I still wake up every day and regardless of whatever accolades are out there and whatever happens and whoever says whiskey of the year and this, that, and the other, that, that is what it is. I wake up every morning and I go, people pay you to make whiskey <laughs> and they don't give you shit about it. <laughs> yeah. right? You get to go to work and you get to say, you get to say things like, I know this sounds weird. But give me five minutes. Yeah, and they don't. They don't say no to it anymore, right? And and maybe it fails, and maybe it's not as much. Uh, it doesn't move as much as it should. But it's very fulfilling, right? It's, it's sure, man. It's yeah. got to be. There's yeah. no doubt about that, man. So I mean, especially going back to your background, you know, doing it as a kid growing up. You know, I was delivering papers when I was your age. You're going around asking people for fruit in their front yard so you can make yeah. brandy for them. I mean, you know, that's that's great, but. Uh, it's got to be very fulfilling for you to know that, you know, you came from that background doing something that some people probably look down upon or, you know, frowned upon because oh, there's people not, in my family that look down on it. Yeah, sure. Right. So now it's like, you know, it's like, Hey, you know, I'm doing this. It's legit in everybody's eyes now, but you know, I know what I'm doing. And obviously people are taking notice of that, man. So that that's really cool. Uh, well, let, me, let, let me tell you one more thing and I'll, I'll let you guys wrap this up. I apologize, but uh, no, man, we're good. You're the, right. The greatest victory that I've had in the past two years, regardless of whatever happens with Spirits of French Lick in the future, the greatest victory that I've had in the past two years is the following. My 
grandfather worked at Kimball's Furniture for 35 years. And uh, for those that don't know, Kimball's actually started off as a company from Jasper, Indiana, that was a money laundering company for liquor production. Oh, so my, grandfather, my grandfather worked there for 35 years. My father worked there for almost 40 years. Uh, I've had several cousins, uncles, etc. Literally, hundred, let's say hundreds of years of furniture manufacturing experience. Yeah. Uh, I was blackballed from that company when I was 18 years old. I didn't go to college. Literally, distilling is the only thing I'm good at. This is my talent. This is what I have. My father blackballed me twice and kept me from getting hired on at Kimball's uh, two different times when I was when I was younger. And I always made my dad a promise because he always believed in me and I always believed in him that I would get him out of Kimball's furniture one day. Yeah. So he's worked with me at Spirits of French Lick uh, the past six years on weekends. And oh, yeah. Two years ago, I got him hired on full time. Nice. That's awesome. And uh, he's there. With, I work with my dad every day. I drive with him to work every day. I drive home with him from work every day. Uh, he has talked to me more in two years driving home and to work than he did his whole life. Wow. Which sometimes is a gift and sometimes is just, please shut the fuck up. With <laughs> it's like, Dad, Dad, you've been drinking too much off the barrels. Okay. So just stop. He, he, he did tell me one time that Def Leppard was a great band and I might have stopped the car in the middle of uh, Highway 56 and told him to get the fuck out and walk. Uh, but, uh, so, you know, it, it's cool to get to work with your dad <laughs> making whiskey. You know, the yeah. same fellow who helped you build a little 10 gallon still. And to have that, to be able to get him out of that situation, right? This, sure, man. The situation you've heard him complain about for 40 years. For 40 years. Right. You know, and, and now you don't have to do that no more, dad. Right. Yeah. Now you get to that's all. We do stuff. We, we make whiskey together. We hang out, you know, and it, it's cool. It's a lot yeah. Of fun. That's, that's real cool. That's, yeah. but I, you know, I'm going to have to go back to the Def Leppard story because they are one of my favorite bands, Alan, because I'm a child of, I'm a teenager of the eighties saying Def Leppard is, well, I, we want to go there. Let, Matt, Mark, let's talk Mark, about I, 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 Let me, let me correct that real quick. I apologize. <laughs> it wasn't Def Leppard. It was Nickelback. The commentary was the following and here's where okay. I got confused. The commentary got was Nickelback came on the radio. He turned it up. I turned the radio off. <laughs> And he goes, what's your problem with Nickelback? And I said, they are Def Leppard without the fucking talent. They got a drummer with two arms and he still can't do half. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And man. he wanted to argue it. And I was like, no, you get out of my fucking car. You're walking the rest of the way. That's another 30 <laughs> minutes of work. You're fucking walking. Right? We ain't fucking playing this game this morning. So. Oh, man. All right. I, I can give you that. I'll, I can go there, man. So, Matt, let's talk about the, uh, the Solomon Scott Rye. What are you getting in terms of the palate and the finish on this? The palate on this one, I pick up much like the Morning Glory. I get that toasted malt right away on the palate that comes in. And then the oak, I think the the fifth year in that uh, in the barrel is really imparting a lot of the oak flavor on it. And then call me crazy, but I pick up like cola. I get a, a taste, a flavor of cola and then a little bit of ginger on the finish. Nice, man. So it's not what you would consider to be. I mean, when you think of a rye whiskey, it's not, you know, people would say mint or spice, you know, high rye, yeah. kick you in the face kind of, ooh, that's so spicy. Um, you know, you don't get that, which is which is very unique, Alan. So, I mean, which is what you set out to do, to do something different. Absolutely. Um, as your version of an Indiana rye. And uh, and I, I really enjoy it, man. I, I, I think it's a great drink. It's something, and this is 105 proof, but Man, it's it, it's a it's an easy drinker. I mean, even straight out of the barrel at one hundred and five. Man, this is this is a really easy drink. Now, when this is bottled, will this come out as a as a bottled and bond? It will be a bottled and bond. Okay. There there okay. there are plans. If I have bottles again, back to that shit. But uh, <laughs> there are plans to do an iconoclast version of that because I've got let's say five barrels that are a little off profile. So uh, you mentioned the cola thing. There's these five barrels that have this weird Dr. Pepper thing going on that oh, okay. I'm very interested in at a little higher proof. So, huh. Very cool. Very nice. Hmm. Well, yeah, for me, I mean, I, I'm, I, I enjoy it, Matt. What do you think, man? Yeah, I do enjoy it. I, it's really unique. Like you were saying where you're, you weren't going for a lot of the typical characteristics that one would expect out of a rye. I think you definitely 
achieve that part of it. It's fun to to taste these last two, especially the Morning Glory and the Solomon Scott, just to taste different things and a different approach to a product that uh, a rye. Mark and I are certainly familiar with buckwheat bourbon, maybe not as much, but just to taste what can come out of distillation and fermentation and what what someone can do given given what they're putting into it. It's been really, really fun to do that. Really interesting. I, I've enjoyed it very much. Yeah. Well, so Alan, so so you're finding things that exist that really don't exist. And that kind of lends to your name, um, which is what you've tagged yourself here on on our on our video screen, but also you're on Instagram, the Alchemist. Um so I mean that's really really how you view yourself, right? I mean, just tell us about that just a little bit. Uh, it's a very, that might be the most egocentric thing about me. It's a, it's a, it's a, a very cocky bullshit thing that I do, um, which is, I don't know, maybe, maybe a little like, uh, I don't you know, think it is. I don't think it's, I don't think it's cocky bullshit at all. I think it, I think it defines who it describes who you are and what your, what your, I think what your goal is and what you're, what you're trying to achieve. Well, and the, and the goal is always just to push boundaries, right? And but right. The, the boundary pushing is a little bit like, um, all right. So you guys got to taste through cool shit tonight, and I appreciate you guys tasting tasting things that most other shows don't taste, right? Things that aren't even out on the market now, but things where I'm like, what's next? Let, let's what where where can we go now as as distillers, right? Especially as an advocate of home distilling and moonshining and all those things. Right. Uh, the next frontier, guys, five, ten years from now, five years from now, single malt whiskey. That's where you're going to be at, right? That's where everybody's going to be talking about the single malt. Right. Whiskey. Ten years from now, though, you're going to be talking about shit you've never even thought about <laughs> at this point. And the reason for that is not the guys that are in the game right now. The reason for that is guys that are playing around in the basement. They're playing around mm-hmm. their shed. They're playing around their garage. We're talking, you know, the guys that rebuild their own trucks and. You know, right. you, you know, have fun on weekends, right? And they're the ones that are going to push that that envelope. And that's what I hope for in American distillation is that it becomes A, a little more regionalized based on local food sheds and watersheds and B, a little more innovative. Like, listen, there's enough bourbon out there for everybody. If there's not enough bourbon out there for everybody right now in five years, there's going to be more than enough bourbon <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. everybody right what is beyond that how far can we push your palates you know you guys tasting the buckwheat tonight that's it's pretty left field for bourbon right sure it's pretty far mm-hmm. out there and if i can take you there and you can find something you appreciate how much further past that can i take you can i take you guys to let's just throw out something just for shits and giggles can i take you guys to banana brandy which is a category you've never even thought about right Right. I see Matt, his face goes, what the <laughs> fuck is going on with that? But in 10 years, Matt, banana brandy is not going to sound weird, right? In 10 years, you're going to be like, I've had three or four of those. This is you know? delicious. <laughs> right. I love it. Right. Right. And doesn't mean you have to love it. You just, it's interesting. It's different. Yeah. And right. It's something you put in front of your friends and you have a good evening, right? So um, that's very much what being the alchemist is about is, is how far can you push those boundaries? What weird shit can you do? And honestly, some of it is a little ego driven, which is, uh, the consulting side of it. I do a lot of mash bills and stuff like that. What can I get people to pay me? To do? Yeah. Right. Because if you can pay me for it. There's a market for it. That's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know? And it's fun and it's fun. Yeah, no doubt, man. I don't see that as ego driven. I see that as a as a business decision and a smart choice, man. So, um, I don't I don't think you should ever apologize for for that in any way, shape, or form, man. Because you push the boundaries, and I think that's what this industry industry needs. There's no question about it. I hope All right, so. guys. Yeah, man. So, Alan, we've had a great time tonight, man. We're gonna Absolutely. wrap it up here, though. But before we do, is there anything else you want to add or say before we close it out? Uh, I'd well, like I guess to we talk- should. I'd like to talk, talk about where we about. can find you guys, where we can find, you know, spirits of French lick and, and, you know, people can come and visit you guys. They probably, that'd probably be good to know. <laughs> I would love to talk shit about Christy, but I, got, I, I ain't got <laughs> nothing I can fucking say other than she gets Christy. So, <laughs> so you, you can find me at spirits of French lick.com. You can find most of our products shipped to 30 plus States at sillbox.com. 
Um, if you're interested at all in Indiana distilling history, you can go to alchemistcabinet.wordpress.com. I think that basically sums it up. Right. All right. All right. I got Appreciate social media, that. but it just probably make you mad. So, <laughs> unless you're a Welsh Irishman, and so just you know, jump in and let him know what you think. Right. So, just lay Matt. It. Yeah, Matt. Before we wrap it up, man, anything you want to add? Hey, Alan. Thanks for sitting down with us tonight. It's been a real treat to have you back on again and to to see what you've done in these episodes since we last had you on, and to get to taste through what you've been doing since then. That's been really, really fun, and it's always great to hear that even as you're piling up all these accolades and your products are starting to speak for themselves, you're not hanging your hat on that. You're always looking to go further. What's new? What's out there? What else can I do? I think that says a lot about you, your personality, uh, your spirit, and and what you all are doing at Spirits of French Lick and where you're trying to take things. So we appreciate that. Yep, definitely. I agree with that, Matt. Um, so before we wrap it up though, I do want to thank all of our sponsors. Again, we are the bourbon life podcast presented by bespoken spirits. I want to thank all of our listeners. We really appreciate all of you all appreciate the feedback that we get. Um, if you have a moment, if you want to send us an email, just to comment and let us know what you want to hear or any suggestions, we'd be happy to hear from you at the bourbon life at gmail.com. You can find us on Facebook, join our private Facebook group, the bourbon lifers. Uh, you can find us on Instagram as well. And again, we just appreciate all of our, all of our listeners and followers out there and everything you guys do for us and all the support. So with that said, I'm going to wrap it up, send us home with our tagline, which is may your glasses always be full and may you keep on living the bourbon life. Thank you for joining us for this week's episode of the bourbon life podcast. Our mission at the bourbon life is simple to share our passion for all things bourbon with you every week. And we'd really love to hear your thoughts on how we're doing. You can find us on Instagram and Facebook at The Bourbon Life. You can also contact us by email at thebourbonlife at gmail.com. And you can always find us on your favorite podcast platform. If you have a moment, we'd love it if you would rate us and give us a review. So until next week, we hope your glass is always full and that you keep on living The Bourbon Life. Whether it's rye, sour mash Tennessee whiskey, or bourbon, Davidson Reserve has something delicious to offer any whiskey lover's palate. Pick up a bottle of one of our award-winning Davidson Reserve whiskeys from your local retailer today. Visit www.davidsonreserve.com for more information. And cheers to drinking local.